But, I mean, now let's give a big hand to Christian, who we have here tonight. Okay, thanks very much guys, and I really appreciate, uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to be here today. And uh, thanks, thanks to everyone for coming, and hopefully I can kind of give you something to think about today. So, um, my name is Christian Rand, I'm a CEO and uh, co-founder of Mentor, and uh, Mentor is the new diabetes movement. Let's see if this works. Yes. So um, I was thinking of speaking about, about Mentor, just in brief, you know, what, what are we about, what, what do we do, what are our products and so on. And then about our big idea, you know, what, what actually is the vision, what, what are we after. And then, um, then about fears, because I think that that's the most important thing, kind of hindering people from, uh, from aiming high and, uh, and stopping very good ideas from becoming good companies. Because there's a lot of good ideas, at least always when I talk, talk to uh, different students and different people, most people have some really good ideas on how to improve life or other, you know, whatever kind of surroundings. But quite seldom do people do anything about it. So I hope I can kind of contribute somehow that people would, would go after their good ideas more. So Mentor, a glucose meter and diabetes, we started from, from here pretty much. And uh, what, what is it about? So we, uh, we developed a glucose meter that is here. So it has the uh, kind of all the components needed for glucose monitoring on a daily basis. And pretty much normally people use this. And uh, there's like some 300 million diabetes patients around the world. And they pretty much 90% of them use these kind of carry bags uh, with, with multiple components like you can see there. So, um, it was a convenience thing and a discretion thing, you know, less social stigma. And uh, now the meter called Discrete is out there and, uh, and we are commercializing it throughout Europe at the moment. And then you know, seeking also further opportunities further away. Um, I guess the, the big thing here was that, that it, it's a, you know, if you, class, if you want to classify it somehow, the Discrete glucose meter, it's a usability innovation. So that, that kind of is the core. It's in a way, we were always fans of Apple already from the start and, and uh, we thought that, uh, or let's, let's put it this way, we didn't think that it, it's absolutely necessary to have some kind of scientific innovation to really build a great company and, and to really do something that can change, change the world uh, on, its, on its own behalf. And therefore I think that the, uh, it's fair to say that this glucose meter is, uh, is most, mostly a usability innovation. But then, uh, then about Mender, so um, our product, we have currently two products, the other one being, uh, being the glucose meter, the only one integrated glucose meter called Discrete, and then the other one being uh, a, a cloud-based glucose data management platform, and, uh, or software platform, and that, that's called Balance. So the idea about, about software is that, that it pretty much gathers data from all different glucose meters, from all of the major Glucose monitoring manufacturing companies, and uh, and uh, it gathers the data from cloud and then presents the kind of patient population to diabetes professionals. And point being that the uh, it allows the diabetes nurses and uh, healthcare professionals to have visibility to their patient population, which currently, uh, you know, it may sound weird, but but it doesn't exist. So how diabetes data is being managed currently is mostly on local computers only in the memories of the meters themselves, or then uh, actually just on paper logbooks. And, and you can only imagine that that doesn't you know, really benefit anyone in the long term, and it's, it's ridiculously difficult to, to get any real analysis done of patients' glucose behavior and any, of, any data training or anything like that. So that's the, that's the other product. And uh, we were founded in uh, Helsinki in 2006, and I guess once again, like you know, in many other other good companies, the idea came from uh, came from one of the founders. As, as one of the founders, he a type one diabetes patient and also an industrial designer. So he was kind of like um, graduating from uh, at that time, graduating from University of Arts and uh, sorry, Helsinki School of Arts and Design, by Tyke, that's the name. Like. And um, and he came up with the uh, with the original idea that, that okay, I've had diabetes since I was a kid. I hate my carry bag, what do I do about it? You know, what can I do to change something? And, and I must kind of raise my hat 
hand to Jukka, who's, who's that guy, and, and he's, he's done a tremendous job. And with his dream, that was the, the spark that started the whole thing. And then we built the, uh, pretty much the uh, founding team around, around Jukka's idea and started pursuing uh, the uh, big idea. Okay, so then um, the CE mark in medical device, medical device technology or any, any kind of medical technology, getting a CE mark is, is a major milestone. So getting regulatory approvals in Europe as our home market uh, for the device so that we can start kind of going after the, uh, the commercialization phase or, or getting, getting the marketing and sales going. That, uh, that was then uh, in, in the uh, summer of 2010 and that took sort of like four years. And uh, medical device development tends to take quite a long time, and, and uh, that's also, uh, I guess, something you know you could be afraid of when you start a medical device company. That, oh no, it's going to take like at least four years or whatever, three years to develop anything. But uh, I must say that we had a lot of fun during that four years. So it, it was a long time, but you know when you look back, it seems like a, you know it just seems like pretty much nothing. At least we had, had a good time, even though it lasted some, some, some time. Um, currently, we have sales from UK, uh, Baltics, Finland, Sweden, and Qatar. And uh, the, the biggest launch and the biggest partner we have so far is Merxerono Pharmaceuticals. And that's Merck is a, Merck is a global diabetes drug company, and they have also other pharmaceuticals. They're like, um, I guess, 6 billion euro company with something like 15,000 people working for them around the world. Uh, they are currently working with their brand and with our brand, so like a co-branding deal. They are selling our product in the UK with 55 people. So it's a pretty massive effort there. And uh, that's something that we have been, it took almost a year to negotiate that deal. So uh, that was also something that uh, I learned a lot of patience through these negotiations, that it, it just takes time. And medical device is a totally different thing than software, or consumer software, or any apps. It, it takes time, so you gotta be patient. But it, it's also a lot of fun. And then the you know the different motivating aspects are of course there, and I'll come to that later. Okay, but then um, patents and IP, intellectual property, is really important in, in medical devices. So that's pretty much all you have. And if, if people want to invest money to help you grow with your company, they always want to know that what's your IP situation. Do you have robust patents? Uh, you know, and do you have a patent portfolio with? Uh, Actually, a lot of patents usually, because otherwise, you know, people who want to help you commercialize medical devices, they need to invest, you know, millions to tens of millions of their money, and they also need to put their own brand uh, at stake, pretty much. So they want to be sure that that when they go out there, that it really holds, that it really works. And uh, then the the investments and the, the money side, uh, we have we have been. Uh, fortunate enough so far to uh, get approximately 13 million euros financing from different sources and the, uh, so there are some of the investors that have invested in the company so far. And Risto Silasma deserves special thanks because he's been, uh, he's been really, really great supporter of the company and, and kind of also taught us quite a lot about what it, what it really is to, to build companies. Okay, so then, yeah, this, no. then I guess uh, this, this starts to contribute to the big idea. So what, what, is, what is it? So um, we, we, had a, we had a vision from the start that, okay, <coughs> we have this kind of idea from coming from the own, own need of one of the co-founding or the one of the founding members. And uh, that idea potentially can, can be something which could be global. It could be something that can help a lot of people around the world. And, and then we started working on a, a vision statement which would clarify that where do we want to be, what do we want to become. And, and that's, that's currently the, uh, the, the kind of text that we've come up with with the uh, whole staff pretty much. That's something that actually has been changing over the years. So we've always been open to, to adjust the vision and the, uh, the, the mission or the manifest statements as we go along. And uh, I guess that. One of my personal opinions is that you've got to be able to adapt. You don't want to fix your strategy so that, okay, we have this great strategy, which is like 10-year innovation strategy or 5-year innovation strategy. If, you know, always when you do something like that and you fix things, 
at least in my opinion, you always also lose something. So if you want to be agile and flexible, um, you know, if you think that that's something which could be your your competitive advantage even, then uh, you're going to be able to change some of these statements. And you're going to be able to see that, is it really there we want to go, or actually a bit, a bit that way. And that's why we've been also flexible with this. So then uh, going further into the big idea uh, we have, uh, or had, and, and still have, uh, what we're actually working on all the time, that can potentially uh, change the world, and that is, I guess, also already doing, doing so in a small, small uh, portion of, of the planet, so to say. Well, diabetes. Diabetes is big. Uh, it's a global, global uh, problem. There's more than 300 pe million people who suffer from diabetes. And it, will, it is pre uh, forecasted or predicted to double uh, over the next 25 years. And that's very unfortunate, but it, it's, it's very real. And there's, there needs to be better ideas, there needs to be better solutions on how to tackle that. And, uh, and you know, like, like I said, there are several, several things that will affect every one of our lives, even if we weren't diabetics. There's, you know, if you think about it, only in Finland, it's 1.3 billion euros that goes into the treatment of diabetes on an annual basis. And uh, that's like, I guess, more than 10% of the whole healthcare budget of Finland. And it means that, it, that you know, you can, you can start to see that kind of money is in your tax percent. So what you, you pay now and what you pay in the future as taxes is also dependent on how well that is. And uh, the, uh, the glucose monitoring market itself, so the, only these, these meters and test strips, that's 8 billion, 8 billion euro market globally. So that's also one of the biggest diagnostic markets there are in the uh, current, current days in the environment. There's some smallest companies who are, who are ruling the market, uh, smallest joking there because these guys are, they are very big and most of them are like in the range of 10, even to 10 to 20 billion euro companies and uh, they pretty much dominate sort of like 90% of, of the glucose monitoring market. And one thing actually that many people asked us when we started with the idea was that are you seriously going to go after a market which is dominated by these guys that they will squash you like fly immediately but we were, I guess we didn't believe anyone that point that we want to be bold. We can, we can really do something and it's like the David and Goliath thing that you know, if, you, if you start being too much afraid of everything you, know, you can't accomplish pretty much anything. So um, then the, uh, I guess the, um, we've always looked at it with the founding team and, and also tried to build the organization around, uh, around that mentality in a way that is somewhat different from the Finnish old school mentality that, that don't try anything because you might fail and, and just go, you know, stay home, don't go outside, you might get hurt. Uh, so we, we wanted to look at it from a different perspective that aim for the stars, land on the moon, like the, uh, I guess that's a US saying. And um, if, you really, if you really want to do something that matters, you've got to aim high. And, and in these kind of big, big kind of scopes, uh, like you know, big fields like diabetes or whatever global problems you're addressing, uh, it's definitely something that, that you have the chance to end, end up at least on the moon, maybe even to the closest star. So um, why should you just be a player in, in a local market or do something very small when you can potentially create a solution that will change the lives of many people in, in, you know, towards and like I said, the, uh, the, the, our own experience was the main, main point of why we started the company. And the, the healthcare, healthcare focus uh, was a very big motivating factor for us. As you know, some of our friends, were, they had some other companies, they were founding some other IT companies and so on. Okay, that's, you know, what, I guess I personally like whatever kind of entrepreneurship, and I'm always being pro any entrepreneurship pretty much. Uh, but then for, for myself, uh, it was very important that there was always that that healthcare focus, and that we could see that our work hopefully eventually will contribute to the health of many other and that help, you know, like quality of life and so on of people. And um, I guess then one of the uh, very important points was always 
that we, we kept on asking ourselves that even, even in the very early days when we were just five guys in a room uh, in the biomedical, which is the, uh, near, near the uh, hospital campus uh, of hospital. the uh, Helsinki University Hospital. Um, and uh, we were kind of like asking ourselves that, okay, this seems to be pretty crazy that we are just five guys starting a company on, on you know, global addressing the global diabetes problem. And, and we have an idea of a meter that potentially can be used all around the world. So it would seem ridiculous that, that okay, there's five guys in a room, what can we really do about it? But we always thought that, and, and we knew some, some other people, uh, like, like the Lifeline Ventures guys, big thanks to these guys, that had done the same thing, that they pretty much started a company from scratch, and they just boldly went after and something that, that went matters. 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 Something that, that matters. You can do it as well. And we looked at other entrepreneurs around the world we knew of, and, and we quite often discussed that if someone else has done it, why the hell couldn't we do it? We aren't, you know, we are definitely not any, any more kind of dyslexic or whatever than anyone else. And if you think about Richard Branson, he's dyslexic and he, he runs a 20 billion or whatever euro company. So, you know, we are not even dyslexic, uh, luckily, so we should be able to do it, if he was able to do it. So um, it's just about the mindset, pretty much. You just have to believe in, in yourself, and, and uh, sometimes when there's difficult times, when you find it hard to find that belief in yourself, just, just try to reflect on something else. And, and maybe even, uh, we had even this kind of sometimes foolish or may, may seem foolish ideas that, that you know, we, we intentionally reflected on, on the people who had been very successful in something because it, it's a mind state, it's, it's a choice. Uh, entrepreneurship and, uh, and being successful is a choice. It may sound weird, but, it, but it, it is really a mindset. You just have to really want to, to be successful in something you do, and you, then you put your heart into the work you do every day, and then that it just usually starts kind of working out. Of course, there might be trouble, there might be whatever, you know, misfortune, okay, that's whatever. Things go wrong and that's it, but, but then you just kind of get up and try again. And uh, if you believe in it, you have much more probabili probabilities uh, in, in, in su uh, succeeding rather than if you really don't believe it in yourself, why, why would anyone else believe you? That, that's also an important question. And you know, I always want to thank some of these guys like Tegas Finvera and the investors and then the board of directors also because the board of directors has been always something for us that we were young guys starting a company and we quite quickly understood that, that this is definitely something that okay, we are enthusiastic, we want to do it, but we, we just don't have the expertise. So we need to bring in people who uh, have already done it in some other aspects, maybe not their own companies, but have been working in pharmaceutical or medical device industry and in, in these kind of leadership positions and so on. So we started looking after people who were looking to join the boards of startups or to become advisors and, and so on. Uh, so the one of the um, sort of like uh, ideas from the beginning was that let's, hey, let's find some good guys, some, some, uh, some senior people to join the board or to be our advisors so that we can learn from them and they can, they can teach us not to kind of fall into every, uh, every possible mousetrap or whatever or uh, to, um, to fail in every possible <laughs> point where you can fail, because there's quite a lot of places where you can fail if you have never done it before, or if you have never been in global business or whatever. So um, uh, that has been a, a massively important thing, that we, we were, I guess, smart enough or lucky enough that we realized how stupid we are, actually, and that we need to bring in people who are smarter than us. And then we need to learn quickly because time is of essence. Please. Yeah, yeah absolutely, please. Um, uh, I applaud you for your bravery um, <laughs> and the vision that you had. But my question is, um, during the, one of the lectures that we had last time, the lady was, uh, who was also an entrepreneur was also stressing on the importance of doing competitor research. And uh, you stress very much that you were um, competing with very big guys. But what kind of value proposition did you have that you were so confident that you could stand up to that challenge? Good question. So um, um, we also did some market research. But then um, from the beginning, we in a way had the idea that we don't want to do too much market research because that also limits you. 
if you do market research, you'll always just get that the pulse of the day in a way, but future is being created by people who innovate. So on the other hand, you need to understand the environment to be somewhat realistic, but if you want to do something really big, you usually have to go after something that is not existent today. And if you only base it on market research, uh, you're maybe not then able to come up with something uh, as radical or whatever. Uh, so that, that was one thing we always kept in mind that, okay, we did some basic market research, but we didn't put too much effort into it. But we rather went around and, and we actually, in the, in the very beginning, in the first year, we did uh, sort of like qualitative market research with diabe uh, diabetes patients and, and nurses and doctors. And we didn't actually ask them like, you know, would you like to use this kind of meter or whatever, but we just followed them in their daily lives and, and kind of monitored what kind of things they, they had on their table and what kind of problems th did they have. But we didn't kind of offer them any, any kind of selection that, you know, please tick the box you like or whatever, because that always influences you know, the information you get from them. And uh, one of the co-founders, Henry Andel, he had, he had actually um, done a, a, a thesis work on, on, a, on a kind of, uh, what do you call it, like a user-centric product development framework. And w that was the, the, the research we did with, with the patients and nurses and so on was part of that framework. And the idea is that you just monitor, you don't actually ask, but you just monitor the people in their daily lives, and then you figure out that what are actually the problems. Because many times people, if you ask them what's the problem, they, they'll describe some kind of problem, but there might be other trouble that, or problems that they are not able to describe. In a way, if you ask people, you know, would you like to have a better, better horse, but people then actually, they'd be happy with a car. So, you know, if you ask them about horses and, and horse is the standard, then they sometimes can't imagine that there could be a car. <laughs> Hopefully that somewhat answered your question. Yeah, so definitely, yeah. So, um, good point, thanks. So the value proposition was that because most glucose monitoring manufacturers, they are big pharmaceutical companies, very slow in product development, very kind of uh, non-innovative, but they just improve marginally their products every year. And uh, actually the life, life cycle of, of these kind of traditional glucose meters is, has been uh, and still is up to 10 years. So it's ridiculously long compared to any mobile phones or anything else. And, and these kind of meters, they have been pretty much the same since since the uh, like, um, 80s. The form factor has been the same since the 80s. And, and then you know, you, the, uh, the one of the founders, Jukka, he had been using this kind of bag his whole life and, and he hated it because you know, you, if you have to use this, you know, is it discreet? Where you have to go to, you know, most diabetes, pa diabetes patients go to the toilet to use this. And then if you have to go to the toilet to be able to use this, not to stand out as someone who has needles and whatever medical devices all the time here, and kind of dodgy stuff. So then you have to go to the toilet or somewhere else that people don't see you. And then that actually many, many times stops you from measuring. Because then you kind of start thinking about it that, okay, I'm really busy now, I have to go to the next lecture or whatever, and I'd have to go to the toilet and then I still ha need also need to eat. And you, know, and you have to do this several times a day, even 10 times a day. Then it starts becoming a real problem. And um, that was one of the value propositions that if you make it like this, if it has everything, all that crap integrated here, I and it looks like a cell phone, you can actually use it so that people just, you know, think that you're, you're just reading a SMS or whatever, and it, it takes pretty much 20 seconds. You put it in your pocket and, and you're, you're good to go. And the other one, one other thing also, that for this you need a table. It's very difficult to do this while you're walking or, or whatever, uh, but with our, our meter, you can use it just like a cell phone with one hand pretty much, and uh, it's very discreet, very easy. You can even use it while driving. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so uh, there's, that's, that's a value prop for the, uh, for the diabetes patients. And then when you have a value prop for the patients that, that really flies, then the diabetes professionals also start getting it pretty quickly that, wow, that actually makes a difference. Because most of them, not all, but unfortunately, but most of them want to do what's good for the patient. So they want to really help the patient as much as they can. Uh, and then, yeah, well, um, I guess the uh, one very important 
thing has been that that the employees we've had in the company all all, all the um, or uh, along the all, all the years there's been some really great people and there still is a lot of great people some people have moved on m new people have come in but but people have always believed in the story and they have wanted to help us and uh, th there's been many 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 very difficult times we've been two times very close to bankruptcy and uh, it's it's been a lot of lot of stress a lot of tears and and sweat and and even blood through finger pricking, uh, and uh, and so I re I'm really thankful for all all the, all the uh, employees and and the whole staff and and all the people who believe in us. So that that makes a huge difference. In difficult times, uh, you only have your own own people, and if if that doesn't work, you, you just you know you can't go on. So it's massively important. And also remember, you gotta you gotta learn to recruit as quickly as possible. Because it's so easy to, to recruit the wrong kind of people and then you suffer and you really suffer in a small team if you have some kind of bad apples, so to say. Some people who are not motivated or who actually want to do something else, it becomes difficult, so that's, that's important. But then I think the, uh, the essence of, of all this, you know, the, you know, pursuing big ideas, entrepreneurship, it's about fears and what's stopping you. You know, it's dreams and fears in a way beliefs and, and hopes and then, then something that you're afraid of. And I wanted to, to talk about fears, uh, you know, towards the end. And I'd like I said also here, just, you know, if you have any questions, please ask at any time. So uh, what is usually stopping people from uh, pursuing their ideas and, and their passion? What, what do they really love to do? Uh, there's numerous stories, you know, if you talk to people and if you listen, or if you listen to people actually, you get quite easily, you know, they tell, tell about what, they, what do they want to do, you know. Someone, uh, I've had many friends, for example, let's, let's, let's take a quick example. Uh, one one uh, friend of mine was a great pianist, but actually um, she, she was still wanting to go to the law school, and you know, that's of course okay. But, but the problem was that, that she was only wanting to go to the law school because of her father, not because of herself. She wanted to be a pianist. But she was so afraid of what the father would think if she chose to be a pianist rather than go to the law school. So she was afraid of that. And that stopped her from pursuing her idea. Okay, she's still a great pianist, but, but she's also a lawyer and, and she doesn't like it. She's not enjoying her career. So, you know, what, is it a good choice or not? I don't know, not, not, not my kind of uh, choice or judgment to make, but, but that's a very simple example of, of people being actually controlled by their fears rather than their dreams. And that's, that's, I guess, the point we always had. Of course, we are also human beings, we are afraid of stuff like everyone else, but it's about controlling your fears. It's about making a, a, a kind of choice, uh, a conscious choice or, or um, sort of like a choice that, that you are very aware of. And that, okay, I select uh, or I choose to believe in that rather than that. And, and then also building that kind of mindset with the group, with the founding team, that there's going to be times when, when we have these and these and these reasons to be very afraid of whatever bankruptcy or <laughs> lawsuits or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff can come up. Uh, but, but, but then you've got to have that support from the group and, and remember that what was the why are we here? And, and if you choose, choose to believe rather than be afraid of all the time, that makes a big, big difference. It, it's so much about mindset. It's so much about just focusing your thinking and, and uh, kind of conquering your fears. And uh, y if you think about it, that what, what do people fear mostly? They're mostly pretty irrational things. I guess in the modern world, you might say that, okay, if you, if you get into a bankruptcy with your company, you're, you're you're unemployed, and then you know, then you can't eat, or you don't, you know, you can't, you don't have a place to, to live in. Is is that realistic? Well, probably not. At least in in our kind of semi-socialistic uh, society, uh, it it just doesn't happen. You know, there's not too many young people in this, out in the streets, or or my my kind of point being that that so many of our fears are just totally, Ill they're just illusions. And uh, I guess that, that uh, people very often still let these illusions limit their life. And so often you hear people talking about that, I would do that if it wasn't that. Or, you know, it, it, it's sort of like, uh, 
like a chain of things that because of that, I cannot get there. But what is that? How often people really think about that? that w- is it really something that they should be afraid of? What is really stopping them? And uh, I think my, my mom has been a great, great person in my life and definitely mom's rule. She, she, she taught me that, uh, that uh, or taught me that, that one, one important question to always ask when you have some big trouble ahead of you and, and something you, you're afraid of or you have a reason to be afraid of. That what is the worst thing that can happen? If you, if you go bankrupt, what is the worst thing that can happen? Can you die? Well, most likely not. Well, can, can you end up homeless? Most likely not. Can you maybe be unemployed for a while? Well, most likely yes, but does it matter? No. W- would that kill you? No. Can you lose your face? Maybe. So what? What face? You know, if you're if already pursuing your ideas and doing something that matters, being true to your heart is something that most, you know, uh, no matter if you succeed or fail, that's already a success. You've al- already conquered your fears. And, and fears, at least in my opinion, uh, they are the biggest, biggest kind of obstacle in any entrepreneurial activity and in any kind of activity where people are, are kind of thinking of, of pers- pursuing their ideas, but they're not, uh, not, uh, not doing it. So I think these are very important things to think about and really kind of discuss about these things in your founding team or whatever with your friends or uh, that is it really something that I should be afraid of? Are there some real reasons to be afraid of? And how much is cultural? How much is just, you know, from your parents or from your relatives or whatever, from your family, that is something that actually uh, is irrational, at least to some extent. And, and then I guess the, uh, it's rather, you know, how we always put it with, with our, our team, that try to learn, be humble, try to learn and evolve and, and use your time on that. Don't use your time on, on being afraid. Focus your thinking. Remember that, that you, you know, it's the same saying applies for, for your mind as it applies for your body. You are what you eat. You are what you think. So if, you, if, you con- if, you, if you're kind of like focused on, on negative thinking, negative things will happen. And, and, you know, you'll kind of direct your way to negative stuff. But if you focus on positives, there's, there's a lot of scientific data on that. You should check it out. The Barbara Fredrickson positivity and a lot of other stuff. Seligman. There's so much that stuff available. A lot of studies from top universities. If you think positive, good stuff happens. And, and it's, it's a choice. And it's an easy choice. You can do it today just like that. And, and that will definitely improve many things. And, and when it comes to entrepreneurial activity, you have to be positive. Because if you're, if you're kind of, you have to be realistic, you have to be careful, uh, you have to be analytic, but you have to be positive to be successful. And uh, the mindset, and it's about practicing also. Practicing to think in a positive way rather than focusing on the negatives all the time. I guess that's, that's my, my five cents. Happy to answer any questions or any, anything, you know, if you have. So, yeah. whoa. So do we have any questions? I think, I think one, one kind of key issue for any, any kind of young person pursuing something really big is really, really um, that I don't know how to do this. And I think, I think you're a perfect example of how you found kind of senior team members who, who can help you with, with that big vision. But I think maybe some advice into how, how you can find those people and how you found those people would probably be quite useful. You're absolutely right. Uh, that's, uh, that's exactly what we also went through. But, but there are those people who want to help you. You just got to call them. As simple as that. You just find their number, you call them and tell them what, what's your idea. And if you get them excited, you, you'll get, some will get excited, some will not get excited, but you definitely some will get, will get excited or then you're a bad salesman. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And by the way, how, how old were you when, it, when you started off? Um, 26. No, yeah, 25, 25, 26, something like that. Well, I guess not. 
So you no, know, it's it's just just you know you just gotta meet meet people, go to them, talk to them, call them. It's not that difficult, really. Most people are actually very curious about new ideas, and and even senior people they they want to do also something with their kind of uh, retirement days, which hopefully can contribute to something cool. Uh, my question um, relates back to the question that the gentleman just asked. Um, usually, young people they aim very high. They're very um, brave, visionary. But then you said that you are very lucky to get some experienced board members who usually are a bit more realistic. Was there any situations when you were saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and they said, hey, calm down, I think that's a bit you know, too much? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I think actually it has been sort of like, uh, you know, uh, from the other side to the other side. So we were very excited, then we got some you know, pushback. And so th that's, w that's how it has, because I, I can think, you know, most things are, they are so, some sort of a waveform. You start from here and you go that way and then you go the other way and then it finally settles to something in the, in the middle. So I guess we had some sometimes even very crazy ideas that were totally intangible or not, not something you could realize uh, or, you know, may, or kind of work out. But then, uh, then on the other hand, the, the senior people also got excited about the ideas that, yes, they also knew about companies who had been started by someone and who, which were built from nothing. But it's a balance between. My question is, why did you choose this specific product? Uh, why the glucose meter, you mean? Well, uh, this came from the, uh, one of the founders, who, uh, who is a diabetic himself, and, and he had been using this traditional kit all his life, and uh, he just hated the kit and he wanted to design and develop something cooler, something a lot easier to use. So it, it came from, the, uh, from the, his own idea of wanting to improve his own, own life. Sorry? So it's like you just followed him, right? You well, believed in him first, and then uh, he found this kind of very uh, useful and helpful uh, idea, and you followed him, so I mean, um, it's like you are uh, doing like something startup. Uh, uh, you might have many other choices. You're right. We actually yeah. had, yeah. So we also had a couple of other choices because we were a team who wanted to do something. We wanted to find a company, be entrepreneurs. So we, yes, we also had a couple of other ideas. But I guess that this idea was the most tangible and in a way something which motivated us because it was healthcare. Okay. It yeah. was something that potentially could affect a lot of people and could contribute to something uh, you know, of well-being, quality of life and so on. And uh, I guess the, uh, when, we ha when that guy had the idea initially, it was about integration, but it wasn't exactly mm -hmm. this in mm -hmm. the very first moment. Mm -hmm. So it has also evolved and developed. Mm -hmm. And once the founding team was gathered and we founded the company, it, we did a lot of iterations on different designs and different ideas on how to make it what it is nowadays. Okay, thank you. And also I found, so I just browsed your website just now, and I found a um, press release uh, on the 7th of July of this year. And actually your company has been awarded the International I mean, Technology five, uh, 50 uh, price. Uh, how did you feel at that moment you got this kind of very honorable prize? Well, we were of course very thankful and happy and, and, and there's been, we've been blessed uh, in, in Mender of having quite a lot of these good different technology prizes on our walls, so, uh, or, or on the, uh, on the cupboard, so to say. So, yeah, we were very happy about it and it's always, uh, it's a great feeling when you, when you kind of get some, somehow um, some good, good credit credit from uh, from these kind of uh, these kind of uh, entities or companies or whatever so yeah thank you um hello so hello. my question would be like so how do you balance actually a, a scalable idea which means you know you can hit really high uh, or actually something very tangible that, you know, with a group of young people with the expertise within the team and you can actually manage it. Because oftentimes, actually, if you come up with a good idea in a way, but probably it won't, you know, affect billions of people in this world. But it's something that you can start with. With that kind of idea, oftentimes, you know, the question is, it's difficult to attract investors to invest in this type of idea. But if you hit really big in the beginning, and then probably it's very difficult to manage, at least. 
So how do you balance between? Well, I guess that um, even if you, if you aim very high, it is also maybe sometimes very difficult to attract investors because they look at you that, okay, this guy's 15 and he wants to do a billion business. You know, that not, that's not credible. You know, so uh, I, I guess it's always a balance. It's, dif it's difficult to answer, you know, anything like, okay, it's going to be like this or like that. So it depends so much on, on what's, the, what's the industry, what's the field, what kind of innovation, and, and what, <coughs> what kind of team you have. So there's, uh, it's very difficult to answer your question. It, it's a balance between you know, understanding your market, understanding the idea and the potential of the idea, and then finding the right kind of investors and right kind of people who start believing in you. So I, I've met like hundreds of venture capital companies, and then one invested, and then some others followed. So it, it's, it's a lot of work also. It's years and years and, and work and work and work. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, so I was, uh, was the beginning of uh, the idea so that you had some friends and you were thinking about, yeah, let's start a company, what could be our idea? Could you kind of walk us through how it went and how you ended up and uh, was where some friends left behind or they decided not to come and then you kind of, with some of your friends, you took it? Or how did it go from deciding that, yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur and ending up with the co-founders and mentor? Well, we had this team of friends, pretty much, and uh, we had a couple of different ideas. And then we ended up that, you know, with, with this, this glucose monitor idea, because it was healthcare, was very motivating, it was something very tangible, something from a real user need perspective, and something potentially global. And uh, that team was a bunch of friends who knew each other from different schools and, and different other activities and, and so on. And then um, three of us, five people, ended up becoming full-time employees. And two, uh, are they left, in, in a way, they were left out by, because they wanted to do something else, uh, but they were always kind of contributing part-time. But it, it then ended up so that three of us, five, ended up being full-time core team members. Uh, five co-founders, but only three full-timers, so. Cool, so let's give a big hand to Christian once more. Cool. Thanks and very much. Thank you. Yeah, and actually before before you leave, I want to remind you about a few things. So first of all, if you want to find co-founders, you have an idea or you are looking to join a startup, you should join us next Tuesday here at the Design Factory 5 p.m. We are organizing a startup speed dating event. So basically you get to meet a lot of new people with different kind of ideas and backgrounds. So definitely a place to be. Secondly, I want to remind you that if you want to get involved in our activities, what we do, learn, learn like so much about the startup scene in general here in Finland or in Europe and in the States, you should join us. Uh, next Wednesday, we have an open meeting here at Auto Design Factory 5, 5 p.m. And it's a weekly, weekly event, so if you cannot make it next time, make it another week. And on top of that, check out our events website altoes.com slash events or follow us on Facebook and Twitter and you'll be updated. Yeah, but now I think we have some beer and beats outside, so hope to see you there. <laughs>